Slip it on the readers. That's right. We're going to read more of this wonderful book called Her Cowboy Dilemma, which strangely enough brings in the topic of forgiveness yet again. So we're starting at page 82. Is it 82 or 81? I don't know because I got the pages clipped together. Hold on. There we go. Okay, we're starting at page 80. Sorry. So what's up with you and Farley? Earlier, Corb asked. God, the tension in that barn was something else. You two never had a thing, did you? Of course, Laurel picked up on the suggestion right away. I'll bet anything they did. They were both in cinnamon stick at the same time today. She told her husband, passing him a bowl to dry at the same time. Wicked sparks. Corb looked at the bowl. He just dried it as if he'd never seen it before, then shrugged and placed it on the table. Anyway, I thought you had a boyfriend in college, Jed something or other. His name is Josh, Josh Brown, and he's not really a boyfriend. Though he'd like to be, Laurel guessed, maybe. Let's get back to Farley. Fill in the blanks, sister dear. Casty had never considered her family to be an especially sensitive on the perceptive bunch. So why was everyone picking up on all these vibes between her and Farley? She had to set them straight now. Farley and I don't have a thing. He just doesn't like me very much. And I guess feeling is mutual. He doesn't like you very much, Corb repeated, as if sounding those words for someone with limited understanding. Right. That's totally believable, Cass. Good cover. He had inside information of some sort, she realized, which could have only come from one source. What did Farley tell you, Corb? Her brother just gave an innocent grin from the experience she knew that nothing she did or said would get him to spill the beans. Brothers. Why couldn't her parents have given her at least one sister? At some point, you have to put your own life on in your priority list, Farley. Liz sounded more upset than Amber had when he called to bow out of their date. He couldn't make the movie or the dinner. Page 81, 81 and 82. Farley pulled into the lane leading to the home where he, he lived all his life except for the years he'd spent going to the university in Bozeman, Washington. The ranch house had been built on the south end of the four sections of wide open meadows with timber ridges and a mile of careless cr creek flowing through it. Once upon a time, his ancestors had tried their hand at cattle ranching, but his grandfather and father had both abandoned those efforts in favor of the veterinary practice, renting out the rest of the land to their neighbors who used some of it for grazing and for the hay. The old barn had been long since converted into an office with examining rooms and stalls and pens for housing the animals that required overnight stays. The situation at the Harringtons was serious, Liz. If they only had called him in three weeks earlier instead of uh, diagnosed the problem themselves, I couldn't just walk out on them to go watch a movie. You need a partner with another vet, Farley. There's too much work for one man alone. Frankly, you could use more office staff as well. You may as willing to go forego a personal life, but I have four kids and a husband. I hate to leave my work undone at the end of the day, but lately I've had to do it. Ah, my paper clips are getting tangled. There we go. Um, I know you work hard and I appreciate it. No way would he put up with all those other lectures she gave him if he didn't. Thank you, but you're missing the point. I wasn't looking for a pat on the back. It's time you made room for more in your life. To put it bl plainly, besides you're a business partner, you need a wife. If he was talking to anyone else, he would have hung up at this point, but Liz was right about one thing. She kept his life running as smoothly as possible, but and he couldn't do it without her. I don't have time for a girlfriend, let alone a wife. He pulled into the garage and shifted into park. That's because I'm home now. Gotta go, Liz. He turned off the ignition and Bluetooth cut out, truncating the rest of their very capable assistance advice. He loved Liz, usually, and then there were times when he'd like to trade her in for a quieter model. His dogs met him as soon as he stepped out of his SUV. Tom and Dick were mongrel terrier mixes. Part of the litter had dropped off at the clinic five years ago. They'd proven to be a great companion, much less trouble than an, er, either a girlfriend or a wife. If only he could work, train them to answer the phones and work from the computer, he'd be set. 
Hey, guys, you hungry? I know I am. Farley made his way in through the side door into the large mudroom with a bathroom attached. He always had a shower and changed after work, no matter how tired or starving he was. The dogs knew this, and they waited patiently for him to finish. Next on him, the priority list were his dogs. Not a big believer in the doggy kibble, Farley fed them a special homemade marsh that, or mash, excuse me, that he kept in the refrigerator. Both dogs loved it and went straight to their ceramic bowls and by the far wall to gobble and enjoy. Now it was his turn. Farley surveyed the gourmet kitchen. 82, 83, 84, 85. Five years ago when his parents retired, he sold one section of his land and pumped the money into sprawling ranch house. He put it in the heated slate floors, new marble cab tree, and all in high-end appliances as well as redoing the bathrooms. The old windows were replaced with triple p panes that blocked the UV light, and a red, new red metal roof replaced its aging asphalt singles, shingles. He bought furniture, too, the kind you saw when you booked into an upscale mountain resort. His f house was now his castle in every sense of the word. Maybe it was a little on the big side for just one man and two dogs, but you never knew. One day, another dog might come along and join the family. As a vet, it was bound to happen sooner or later. Sometimes his mom got in his case, too. Like Liz, she thought that marriage and children were the holy grails of life. She didn't seem to get that when you get where you're do, when you to get that when you were doing the work you've been born to do, a family sometimes seemed more like the desert than the main course. Not that he didn't enjoy the company of a woman now and then, and Amber had her charms. He found her intelligent, attractive, and pleasant company. Fortunately, she was easygoing as well, since so far they had to cancel three of their seven dates. He told her that he would call her when he got home, but it had been five hours since the crackers and cheese Maddie Turner had fed him, and he was getting lightheaded. Farley took out a carton of eggs and loaf and bread. He felt as though he could eat all of this and more. It had been a while since he used his fancy kitchen to its full potential. Maybe on the weekend he'd invite Amber over for dinner. 84, 85, 86, 87. But when Farley tried to imagine Amber standing by the stove or sitting across from him at the table, all he could see was the golden-haired Cassidy, sweet as honey one minute and fired up as a bumblebee the next. Easy going did not describe Cass Cassidy, but she was so deliciously alive. She'd been around since... Uh, She'd been around 17 when he stopped seeing her as a spunky little girl and saw her as a desirable woman. He could also remember the exact moment he'd been watching TV with her brothers when she came down the hall dressed in a jean skirt and a t-shirt. Her long blonde hair had been freshly washed and she'd been wearing makeup for the first time that he ever noticed. Wow, he thought. He hadn't stared, but it was taken all of his self-control not to. She was too young, the sister of his best friend. He knew the feeling weren't appropriate and he had done his best to deny them. But when he saw her at that bar on her 21st birthday, he hadn't been able to resist asking her out. That date started perfectly. Olive had smiled at him warmly when he arrived to pick up Cassidy, letting him know that she approved of him dating her only daughter. And Cassidy had looked beautiful, quieter than usual, but absolutely beautiful. They danced the first set as if they were the only two people in the room. Gazes fused, bodies coming together like two pieces of an interlocking puzzle. And then she asked for a drink, and by that time he returned with a requested glass of punch. She was dancing with someone else. This all happened a long time ago, four years. He thought about it, and he thought he'd put it behind him. But then he'd seen her today and felt that old punch of attraction. What had been up with that? It didn't make sense. One Kansas City Lamberts had seemed like his dream girl, but the reality was different. She'd grown up like into a spoiled brat who treated men like dirt and wanted to live the high life in the city. Not that he had anything against city folk, but he sure had no use for a woman like that in his life. Okay, and that was page 86, 87, 85, 86, 87. Moving forward. Okay. We're going to try and get you guys to page... That's me, myself, and I. At least 107. I know that's not much reading tonight, but like I said, I'm a little tuckered out. Page 92. Mom thinks Farley walks on water. 
Casty confided to Sky as they headed to, out of the house toward the pasture. So do my brother. Sky cocked her head as if to say, Go on, Cassidy did. Cassidy did. Well, he is a pretty good vet. I'll give him that. But the most eligible bachelor in bitter, bitter root country? That has to be stretching things. Cassidy's mood lightened when she spotted the ranch's working horses munching on the hay Jackson rolled out for them earlier. She slipped between the rungs of the wooden fence. You stay here, Sky, she told the border collie, and Sky prompted lowered her onto her haunches. Casty had grown up with most of the horses and considered them just as much as her family as Sky did, and her brothers. She made the rounds, saying hello to each and every one of them, at the same time checking the signs of dreaded strangles. Finally, she came to her own coffee-colored Mustang, Finnegan. She owned him since she was eight, and he, he was now twenty-one years old. Hey, old man, how come you're not chowing down like the others? She offered him a hunk of carrot she scratched from the fridge earlier. Finnegan gave it just a sniff. Page 93. She patted his neck with some of the light brown hair that went flying. You could use some pretty serious grooming, huh? In fact, all the horses were... Looking scruffy. Hey, Cass, she swiveled around following the sound of Corb's voice. He just left the barn and was walking in her direction. If you have time today, they all could use a little action with shedding shears. I notice it's been hard without Brock, Corb shrugged. We can't seem to get enough done in a day, despite the extra workers BJ hired. Their eldest brother had returned to the rodeo circuit a week after Brock's funeral. Casty suspected he hired the extra workers as to assuage his guilt for leaving them all so quickly. Not that she did been any better, she'd gone right back to school, hoping she could run from the heartbreak of losing the brother. Focusing on her study, she had helped some, but she'd spent a lot of tearful nights. I guess it would take more than one hired wrangler to replace our brother out here, Cassidy said sadly, eyeing the neglected herd. Jackson used to take care of these guys as well as handling all the administration work and accounting, page 94. But I asked him to step in and manage the breeding program, so he's pretty much run ragged these days. Is that why he's being so standoffish? Overwork? Corb gave the idea less than two seconds of thought. No, I think he still feels guilty about the accident. But it wasn't his fault. There was nothing he could have done. Savannah Moody had made that clear after the investigation had been comp completed and no charges had been laid. He still blames himself, and I guess I understand how he feels. I probably feel the same in his shoes. Have you tried talking to him? Of course I've tried, but he doesn't help that Mom is treating him more coldly than she used to. For some reason, their mother hadn't been keen when her husband came up with the idea of taking one of her, on her foster son, but while Bob Lambert usually gave in to whatever Olive wanted on this point, he'd been surprisingly firm and Jackson had come to Coffee Creek Ranch where her father had treated him like the same as one of his own. If only Dad was still with us, he'd know what to say to make Jackson feel better. Page 95. Maybe he could, Corb sighed, but we might as well wish the accident had never happened. Dad and Brock are both gone. We have to deal with it. He glanced at Cassidy, and then she wondered if he thought her plans to work in Billings were selfish, when she was so obviously needed here. Do we have any money to hire more help? Corb nodded. When Jackson moved to the breeding program, the plan was to find a new accountant so he would have, wouldn't have to bother with the desk work anymore. But so far, Mom hasn't given the go-ahead on that. Casty could guess why. Her mother expected her to fill that role. I'll do what I can while I'm helping out while I'm here, Corb, but I can't stay. I worked hard for that, my degree, and I want a chance to use it. Besides, after living apart from her mother the past five years, she could never go back to living in the same house as her. The crepe episode was a perfect example of how a simple little thing could get her all upset. Life was too short to keep doing that to herself. I just couldn't come back here to live. I'm sorry. That was page 94, 95. Moving on to page 96. Hey, Corb patted her shoulder. I didn't mean to make you feel guilty. I get it. By the way, you still have to tell Mom about Winnie's baby. She's off to Lewistown today and may not be home until tomorrow. Thanks for letting me know. He stepped back from her and then gave her a horse a good look over. So you, how do they seem to you? Any signs of the strangles? Nothing obvious, but I noticed Finnegan seems to be off his food, and he didn't want the carrot I just offered him. She unclenched her fist where the untouched chunk of carrot still sat. 
Damn, Corb said, the Mustang more closely than shook his head. Doesn't look sick to me, but just to be sure, we better put him up in a separate area of the barn, keep him away from both Lucy and the other horses. Casty nodded. She already decided the same thing, though she was most positive that Finnegan didn't have strangles. He couldn't. Still, she brought him into the barn, settling him into the stall farthest from Lucy's. An hour later, Corb had two fi hired hands, tacked up four horses, and went to the st sort some calves for branding. Casty busied herself cleaning Lucy's stall and hauling the soiled hay away and burning it per Farley's orders. Two hours later, she had to admit that Finnegan was looking worse. She offered him some oats and given him a thorough grooming, but still he wasn't eating, seemed decided lack luster. Much as she didn't want to, she could see no reason, to, no alternative. She had to call Farley. Casty made the call from the barn using the phone in the office where she and Farley just talked one day earlier. She hoped to clear the air with him, but the truth was she even felt more awkward now than she had before. So she was relieved when his phone was answered by someone else. Farley and Sons, said a woman with a brisk no nonsense voice, Liz speaking. Even though Farley now worked on his own, he hadn't changed the name of the business to reflect this. Hi, this is Cassie Lambert from Coffee Creek Ranch. Farley was out here yesterday looking at one of our horses. Cassidy Lambert? Yes, I see. Page 96, 97, 98. Was it her imagination or did the woman's voice shift from businesslike to frosty? Well, if you're wondering about the test results for your Palomino, it's going to take several days before we know for sure. I was actually calling because we have a second horse off his feet, and I was wondering if Farley could come and take a look at him. Dan has a full schedule today and plans for dinner with his girlfriend tonight. Dan Farley had a girlfriend? She knew that she shouldn't be surprised or even interested, but she was both. Fighting the urge to ask questions that weren't appropriate, Casty refocused on the issue that did matter. The second horse is older, and I'm afraid he has strangles. It could hit him hard. I'd really appreciate it if Farley could come as soon as possible. Well, he could maybe squeeze in a visit tomorrow. He was planning to swing by Silver Creek then anyway. Tomorrow? Casty hated to wait that long, but it didn't seem that she had any choice. Do they have the str strangles at Silver Creek, too? Not at all. Far as we know, you're the only ones in the area which meant the mysteries of how Lucy contracted the bacteria infection was still unsolved. Maybe it had been second-hand tack. Casty ended the unsatisfactory call and went back to check on the horses. While she was applying a fresh compress to Lucy's neck, Corbett hired men back with their horses. They, could look, they looked dirty and tired, but she offered to brush down the horses and clean the tack for them. The men gave gratifying smiles, passing off the horses before taking off for their well-deserved dinners. Careful to protect the horses from infection, Casty brushed them on the outside before letting them loose in the pasture. Then she turned to the tedious job of disinfecting the tack room. The job took several hours and she was tired, sweaty and hungry. By that time she finished, still rather than head in for the shower and meal that she craved, she washed thoroughly and went back to Finnegan. There wasn't much light left in, at that day and point, but she didn't need it to see that Finnegan had deteriorated. He had discharge in his nostrils, and he still hadn't touched either oats, the carrot, or the hay she left out for him. Heck and darn. Page 9899. Lucy was doing worse, too. Not only were the glands in her neck visibly more swollen, but she seemed to be struggling with each breath. Mentally, Cassie went over the instructions Farley had left with her and wondered if she'd missed something. She wished that she'd come, had someone to ask, but it was pa past eight o'clock now, and there was no one around. She could always call Corb at the cabin, but he had no more experience with strangles than she did, and he already had a precious little time to spend with his wife and baby daughter. Liz said Farley might make it tomorrow morning, so she'd just have to hang on until then. Looks like it's going to be a long night, she said, speaking out loud as she set up the cot that they used when she kept watch over the pregnant mare. She made a pot of coffee in the office and found a box of granola bars stashed in the bottom filing cabinet. She ate one for herself and then broke a second up for Skye. They had an old radio in the barn tuned to a local country station and she put it on. It helped to have a little music and the radio announcer for company, though she could have done without the ads, which were jarring at the best of times. She wondered what Josh was doing and took 
her phone out of her back pocket, two missed calls, and three text messages. Going out for lunch with Kate and Liam, two of their college friends, then an hour later, wish you were here too, and the final message sent just 15 minutes ago, you're quiet, what's up? She thought about answering, but her heart wasn't in it. Josh had grown up in Great Falls and never even owned a pet. He tried to be sympathetic, but he really didn't understand why she was so upset. Besides, she didn't feel like talking. She hated to see any animal suffer, and when they were animals she knew and loved, it was even harder. She sat on the overturned wooden bucket at the back door of the barn. With one arm looped around Skye's neck, the sun was setting and rolling hills to the west and never looked lovelier against the swirls of vivid orange and red. This must be the most beautiful place in the world, don't you think? For the answer, her dog rested her muzzle on Casty's knee. They'll be all right. I mean, the strangles isn't fatal, at least not usually. Gosh, she was tired. Page 100-101. She only managed a few hours of sleep last night and today. She had been a lot more active than usual. Thankfully, the rest of the horses seemed fine. The four horses she groomed earlier were enjoying their evening feed with the rest of the small herd. Once the sun was down, Cassidy decided she might as well try to catch a little sleep, leaving on the lights in the office and the tack room, so she didn't feel quite so all alone. She sank into the narrow mattress and closed her eyes. A few minutes later, she became aware of a high-pitched noise rising above the music on the radio. Sky growled and went to close the barn door, whining to be let out. Coyotes, come back here, Sky. Ignore them. It was the mark of Sky's obedience that she listened and returned to lie at the foot of Cassidy's cot. But by the dog's uneasy stirrings, Cassie could tell she wasn't going to be going back to sleep. There had always been coyotes here on the ranch, just like the moose, elk, and white-tailed deer. They were part of the natural order. But tonight, their nighttime cries sounded closer than normal. Eventually, they quieted, though. Probably they moved on farther down the valley. Cassie relaxed and finally drifted to sleep. 102-103 Farley was surprised to find the Lambert's house completely dark when he pulled up in his SUV at 10 o'clock that evening. He felt like a fool for taking Amber home early when their dinner and after their dinner and for driving out all this way. He started to pull a U-turn, then he noticed a couple lights on the at-home on the at barn where Lucy was quarantined, so he parked and grabbed his black kit from the passenger seat. A series of motion-activated lights illuminated the path for him as he made his way to the barn. His boots crunched on the gravel path, mixing in with a chorus of from the frogs in the nearby lake. As he grew closer to the barn, a new sound rose softly in the air. He recognized the refrain of a popular country tune. The radio was on. He'd been listening to the same station on his drive over there. Sky was waiting at the barn door for him. Where you found Sky, you were bound to find Cassidy. But at first he saw no sign of her. Two horses nickered at him. One was Lucy. The other was the opposite end of the barn. Had to be the second horse Liz had reported Cassidy suspected was sick, too. A closer look told him it was Finnegan, the Mustang Cassidy had ridden when she was growing up. This wasn't good news. Finnegan had to be getting on in years by now. The older horse would have a tougher time with the strangles. Once his eyes had adjusted to the low light in the stables, he finally spotted Cassidy. She was sleeping on a cot next to Finnegan's stall, curled up with a blanket that he seen in the office the other day. A feeling that was both powerful and tender welled up in him. Why? It didn't seem to matter when that she treated him like dirt, that she spurred his way of life. He wished like hell that he could transfer those feelings to Amber, a woman whom, much, who, whom such a longing would make a hell of a lot more sense. The song ended and the radio announcer started in on a weather update. Casty eyes opened slowly. She stared right at him blankly at first. Then her eyes rounded and she whispered, Farley? I can't believe you're here. Liz said it was an emergency. He turned away, fighting an impulse to hold out his hand to help her up. This is page 103, 104, 105, 106, and 107. She didn't need anyone, anyway. Quickly, she stood up, planting her feet. She hadn't taken off her boots on the concrete floor. What time is it? About a quarter to after ten, he guessed. Really? Thanks for coming out so late. Don't worry about it, he said, brushing her aside the thanks. Just wait till your mother gets my next vet bill. You're probably going to hear the shriek all the way to Billings. Well, it was still awfully nice of you. She was up by now, moving to Finnegan, stroking the horse and crooning. Hey, baby, don't worry. The vet's here now, and he's going to help you, she turned to Farley. His heart clenched at the sight of her face and all that he could read in it. 
It seemed so genuine, her concern for the horse, but in a few more weeks she'd be in Billings. How much would she care then? He put a hand on the Mustang's flank and began his inspection. How was he acting today? Kind of listless. Wouldn't eat not even his oats or a carrot, she exhaled despairingly. Everything you said to watch out for. Well, he is running a fever, he confirmed ten minutes later. And there is this little clear discharge. I'll take a swab for testing, but I think in this case it would be smart to start on antibiotics right away. Maybe we caught it today early enough that it'll help. He moved to Lucy next. How's our other patient doing? She hasn't eaten much today either, and starting late this afternoon, she seemed to be struggling to breathe. I have had been changing her hot compresses every 20 minutes, except for when I fell asleep, she added guiltedly. Lucy's having trouble breathing because those swollen lymph nodes are pressing right up against her airway. We need to relieve the pressure and soon. Poor Lucy, I should get some more hot compresses. No, I was hoping the abscesses would burst on their own, but since they haven't, we'll have to lance them. Will it hurt her? Not if we do it right. Are you willing to help? She looked insulted. Of course I am. It won't be pretty. She put up her chin. You don't think I can handle a little puss? Not a little, a lot. And I don't know what you can handle, Cass. I just thought it was fair to warn you. Let me see. I'm trying to see where I marked the end of the next few pages, but it looks like I marked a lot of the next few pages. <sighs> well, we're going to keep going. I'm going to try to hit page 120. That's a good ending point. Chapter 6 on 108. Why did Farley being around why did being around Farley always have to be so complicated? She'd been so relieved at first that he was there, and she was no longer alone and with her worry and fear. True, she could have called Corb or Jackson, but handling the strangles outbreak was her responsibility, and her brothers already put in long days. Besides, what could they have done she had wasn't already doing? Farley was different. He was a vet, obviously, but he also had a calm, take-charge attitude. Just his presence was enough to make her feel better. For a while, but it didn't take long for another emotion to tangle up her heart. She felt defenseless, confused, and even angry. Page 109. He had the disapproving way of looking at her that made her feel so small. Yes, yeah, she behaved abnormally at the harvest dance four years ago, but it had been four years, and she finally apologized. So what was he holding against her now? She, she felt sure it was something. I'll need some clean rags, Farley said as he pulled an equipment from his open case. She saw a bottle of antiseptic cotton swabs, a big, ugly-looking knife. Suddenly she felt woozy. She went for the rags, glad to have an excuse to look the other way for a while. She'll put on a brave front, but the truth was she hated icky things like pus and vomit, and especially blood. But she would get through all past of that tonight. She had to do it for the horse whose heart was as wide and open as Montana's skyline. Cassie's determination to be brave was sorely tested in the next twenty minutes. It was awful watching Farley cut through the abscess. Lucy was a trooper throughout, a model patient, Farley said, and fortunately once the pus was gone, her breathing immediately returned normal. When it was done, he showed her how to prepare a tamed iodine solution. You'll need to flush the wound once a day to keep it clean of infection. They were arm to arm as he said this. She could feel his warmth, the solid bulk of his broad shoulders against her light, slight ones. Like this, he demonstrated, then handed the solution in gauze to her. She followed his example, feeling pleasure when he nodded his approval. Good job. Most people wouldn't have been able to stomach a procedure like this one. It was tough, she admitted, but I was so worried about Lucy, I kind of put, my, put it out of my mind. I guess you haven't changed all that much after all. Still can't handle to see an animal suffer. Casty's breath caught in her throat. He was so close that she could smell his cologne over the pungent odor of iodine. But wait a minute. That scent was too sweet and floral. It had to, it, it to be something a man would wear. And then he remembered what Liz... Then she remembered what Liz had told her. So how was your date? Farley dropped his syringe, then recovered it from the straw bedding and tossed it in the bag containing the pus-soaked rags. What makes you think I was on a date? 
She followed her nose, which led her to the collar of his shirt. It's either that or you've started to wear joy, not the first choice for men who wear cologne. Stop sniffing me. She backed off, amused. Why not? It's nice. I bought a bottle for Laurel at Christmas. I do not smell like perfume. He was embarrassed, she noted with glee. My mistake. It must be Lucy, that silly horse. I keep telling her the stallions prefer her natural pheromones. Farley looked pained, and then he laughed. If you must know, I was out on di dinner with Amber Ellis. I had no idea she wore Joy perfume, but at least now I know what to get her for her birthday. Amber Ellis. Corb had dated her a few years back. Cassie remembered liking her a lot, so why did she feel this sudden flash of irritation toward her? Farley packed up his bag, instructed her on the various medications and treatments for the horses, then rolled up his sleeves and washed at the sink. Should I stay out here and keep an eye on them, she asked, when what she really wondered was whether Farley would be heading home now or to Amber's. We've done all that we can do tonight. Go inside and get a decent night's sleep. They'll be okay until morning. In fact, I'm expecting Lucy will be a whole lot better by then. Cassidy didn't ask about Finnegan. She was too afraid of getting the wrong answer. That's page 110, 111, 112. The next morning, Cassidy was so up to early to check on the horses as Farley predicted. Lucy was much improved. Cassidy fed her warm mush, administered her the antibiotics, and mucked out the stalls. After she burned the soil bedding as before, the disinfected feed in the water buckets. There wasn't much she could do for Finnegan, though, who still had little appetite and the telltale strangles nasal discharge while his glands hadn't swollen as much as Lucy's had, Cassie prepared hot compresses for him anyway. She was on her way back to the ranch house when she spotted Corb on the other side of the yard. Want to come out for a ride, he asked. I need to fix a section of fencing on the northern boundary. The sun was shining in a cloud-free sky. There was nothing Cassie would rather do, but she shook her head. I better stay close to home to keep an eye on Finnegan. How's Lucy? A lot better. Last night she's having trouble breathing, but Farley came by and lanced the abscess. She's almost her old self today. Farley came by, huh? Must have been pretty late. Now that's good service, I say. Cassidy noticed the teasing glim in her brother's eye, but she knew how to keep him under control. Yes, unfortunately he had to cut his date with Amber Ellis a few hours short. You remember Amber, don't you, Corb? He flushed just as she'd hoped he would. You pest. Better get to the kitchen if you're not coming out riding today. Mom has some errands she wants you to run. She got her back about an hour ago and is in the kitchen making a list. Before you saddle up any of the horses, make sure they seem healthy, she reminded him before he, she left. Let me know if any of them aren't eating or seem listless. You got your phone on you, he asked. She nodded. Page 112, 113, 114. Okay, I'll call you if there are any problems. As she headed to the house, Casty wondered what mood her mother would be in. Olive had stopped by the barn earlier, making their morning rounds later than usual. She'd spent the night in Lewiston. They hadn't talked much, though, since Olive hadn't wanted to risk spreading the strangles by stepping inside the barn. Having the riding horses in quarantine was bad enough. It would be a disaster, though, if the quarter horses were infected. She found her mother in the kitchen making a fry up in the huge cast iron pan that had been in the family pretty much forever. Cassidy cringed as she thought about the crepe making fiasco the previous day. She should have known better than to try something new with her mother. Mother only liked new ideas when she thought of them. Help yourself to coffee, Olive said. This will be ready in a minute. How's my Lucy doing? Cassidy caught her mother up with the latest developments and then listened to her mom talk horse prices while they ate their scrambled eggs mixed with sausage and tomatoes and onions. Page 115. When they finished, Olive asked her to move her belongings to Corb's room. The painters are coming today. That was fast. The curtains and dovet cover won't be ready for a few weeks, Olive said, but the new armor is being delivered on Friday. New armor? I paid for it in Lewiston yesterday after my meeting, she added, looking at her daughter as if she thought she was a little slow for not keeping up. In Cassie's opinion, the last thing she they needed to be worrying about at this busy time of year was redecorating her bedroom, but she knew better than to complain. That sounds great, Mom. Nothing is too much for trouble for my kids. Her mother got up and patted Cassie's cheek and then pulled out a shopping bag and looked at what I found for Stephanie inside the tiniest pair of cowboy boots that Cassie had ever seen. Gosh, these are cute. Also in the bag was a tiny jumper with cowgirl printed on the front, a velvety soft stuffed horse, and a picture book about farm animals. With well, the Lambert family, 
indoctrination started early. 114, 115, 116. That's so nice, Mom. She set the bag aside, feeling a pang for another new baby in the family. Cor better tell her mother soon. The longer they delayed, the worse Olive was going to take it. Just then, her phone signal with an incoming tech message from Corb, and the message was simple. Tell her. Heck and darn, was he serious? Not my place, she texted back. Please. Casty thought. Casty sighed. She really did hate her mother not knowing this. Mom, I found out something major last night when I dropped in on Corb and Laurel. Olive frowned. This sounds like bad news. More like a big surprise. Sit down, please. She waited until her mother was actually in the chair before she continued. You know how Winnie has been staying at her parents because of health issues. I always said that woman didn't have strength to be a rancher's wife. Actually, she has a good reason for not returning to Coffee Creek sooner. She had two months pregnant. She was two months pregnant when Brock died. That's page 116, 117. Olive gasped and Cassie jumped to get her mother a glass of water. Winnie had a little boy in January. Brock's son? Cassidy nodded. Oh, my word. Why didn't she tell us? Think about it, Mom. Can you guess why she might have been reluctant? A rare flush ro rose on Olive's cheeks. She was grieving, and according to Laurel, she had a very high, difficult pre pregnancy. So we've got to be understanding. Besides, if we get Winnie angry, we may lose at any chance to be a part of Brock's baby's life. Olive nodded slowly. You're right. Good. So don't go doing anything or saying anything that you might regret later. Again, Olive nodded. I'll have to think about this. That was page 116, 117. And guess what? We're making it to 119 and 120 right now. Laurel handed her coffee cup. So how was your night? Corb tells me that Farley dropped by for a while. He also said that Farley is dating Amber Ellis. Really? He passed that along already. Laurel smiled smugly. Text message about five minutes after you told him. Casty laughed. Well, at least the lines of communications are working in your marriage. That's all you have to say? What about Amber? Aren't you upset? Why would I be? Laurel just raised her eyebrows. Casty took her coffee cup and a to-go cup, plus a bag containing several cinnamon buns that Laurel pressed to, onto her. She certainly wasn't going to admit, not even to Laurel, that she didn't like the idea of Farley and Amber one little bit. Let's see here. If this is small, I may read it. Well, it's not small. So that means we're going to have another book review of the same book continued in the near future. I can't guarantee that it's going to be tomorrow night because Mondays are crazy for me. Um, there's Monday Night Raw. There is work until 7. There's supper. And we have two stores to go to tomorrow night. So like I said, Mondays are extremely crazy. I hope to get with you on this sometime this week so we can finish up this book because I am reading another book plus doing my artwork. So for that, you'll just have to stay tuned.